It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 126, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today, Ray Tyler, raises about an acre of salad greens at Rose Creek Farms in Selmer, Tennessee, about two hours east of Memphis and three hours west of Nashville. He farms with his wife, Ashley, and his five children, as well as employees. Produce is sold at Farmer's Market through a CSA and to grocery stores in Memphis. Ray tells the story of his farm from its start as a mixed vegetable and livestock operation in 2010 to its current focus on specialty salad greens, baby root vegetables, and tomatoes on a small scale. We discuss the never-ending vicious cycle of failures that Ray encountered in the beginning years of the farm and how the life-threatening illness of a young child resulted in Rose Creek Farms transition from a failing operation into a thriving, joyful vegetable production machine. Ray also provides insights into the challenges and opportunities of farming in the South, including a fantastic tutorial on summer lettuce production in that challenging climate. We also dig into how Ray leveraged an intensive education to make his farming transition and the large and small practical changes that make it possible for Rose Creek Farms to gross big dollars on a small acreage. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com And by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easier to work with your buyers, saving time, reducing errors, and increasing your capacity to work with more buyers overall. Farmersweb.com And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com And hey, before we get started today, I, I want to say a word about Nigel Walker, uh, who was the founder of Eat Well Farm in Dixon, California. Nigel died on Saturday after a long time living with cancer. I can't say that I knew Nigel well, but his interview on the podcast remains one of my favorites. He was a creative, cheerful, and innovative man, and the world is a lesser place without him and better for having had him in it. Ray Tyler, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Chris, it is an honor to be here. I'm so glad that you could join me today. It's, uh, you know, you and I have been talking for quite some time. And, and since the first time we've been in touch, I've been like, wow, this, you know, raised up to a lot of really interesting things out there in Selmer, Tennessee. So can you kind of give us the lay of the land and, you know, where you're located and what you're doing out there? Yeah, so we're we're out here in we're about two hours, um, two hours east of Memphis and about three hours west of Nashville. So we're kind of like in the middle, middle of nowhere. And when I go to the, to the, the farmers market uh, up north in Jackson, I tell folks that we're from you know Selmer McNary County. They always go, you know, I didn't know anything could grow in Selmer, Tennessee. So we are kind of <laughs> in this region where there's just not a lot of, um, well, there's really no produce farmers that we know of who are doing anything on any kind of um, serious scale, you know, just mainly um, row crops and, you know, cattle farmers. And so we've got about a one acre market garden here. And we sell a lot of salad greens. We do like you know, just all the whole the whole range between the baby mustards, the arugula, all that stuff, baby root veg, and of course tomatoes in in the spring and summer. And you know we're we're taking that to to mar to two different markets, uh, a lot of restaurants in Memphis, and some other different you know wholesale. Um, Outlets were also getting to a lot of uh, grocery stores, which were really loving. And I've got my uh, my wife is with me, so she is what we have recently come to the reality that she's actually a full time farmer and a full time stay at home mom. We're still trying to figure out how those two work at the same time, but uh, she's she's amazing. We also have uh, five young children who are with us as well. Um, we we homeschool them. And yeah, so we're just uh, we're just out here trying to, you know, beat this Mid-South humidity and oppressive heat. And we're having a great time doing it. Now, when you talk about an acre of salad greens, that's not what you were doing several years ago. 
No, but no. So when we first started, we were actually mainly in the meat business. So we were 75% of our business was pork, poultry, eggs, turkeys. And that, that was our, our main, you know, really bread and butter. And we had, I would say we had around two acres of produce that we were basically plain and failing doing with, with a tractor. And, uh, you know, I, I think we kind of, you know, when, when, when you first start farming, um, with not a lot of good examples in the area, we were just really just taking a lot of stabs at, at just a lot of different things, start trying to figure out what we enjoy doing, what will sell. Um, I think that's important is is uh, we've definitely have realized over the years that we can't be too romantic about certain crops or certain products that, um, you know, if they're losing money to get rid of them. But, you know, we were just basically trying a bunch of different produce, a different a bunch of different animal um, kind of businesses to see what kind of stuck. So we ended up having a pretty successful animal business. Um, you know, we weren't making very much money at it, but we kind of had some systems down and we've kind of finally kind of had this turnover of product that was pretty consistent. We were still definitely struggling a lot on the produce end, mainly because uh, I was a terrible tractor operator. And I think I was farming with all the wrong tractors and equipment. And, and also, I think trying to do two... I think the meat and produce, trying to do those two at the same time, was a, it was a huge challenge for us. Um, so that's kind of what we started out doing before we kind of made some, some changes to our system. Um, we, we enjoyed the animals. We really loved seeing the pastures get greener over the years. Um, we love that whole process. We really, um, we saw there was a need in West Tennessee for, for the free range, um, pastured animals. And so that definitely kind of drove us to do that more. But I, th- I think we, there was, there's definitely this, there's this point of scale to really make the, the animal business really, really work to where it's really generating plenty of income and you don't feel like you're just always investing in more infrastructure and trying to find more land, more pasture. We didn't have a lot of pasture to work with. And so we were definitely fairly limited. Um, So yeah, so there was definitely some, some challenges that we were facing with, with the whole animal meat, meat business. And, um, and, you know, at the same time, trying to figure out how to, how to grow produce and what, what's, what grows in our climate and what, what sells and all those, all those different things. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, a general idea, you know, kind of how we, how we got started and what we were doing. Um, you know, how long ago was it that you guys got started farming? We started in 2010. So that was about seven years ago. Our, our second daughter was born. Um, I don't know. Have, have you ever heard of, uh, do you know Paul and Allison Whitaker? Or know, know yes. of their name? So it's kind of an interesting stream of events. We had, uh, there was, we had found out this guy in North Mississippi who had some, he was growing some sort of vegetables. And so we went down there and visited him. And he had spoke about this guy in Kentucky who was growing just amazing produce year round. And so he gave us his book, which uh, they wrote called Walking Into Spring. Just a fantastic book for, you know, growers in, in, in our region. So we went there and visited him. And it was in November, I believe. And we went in there and he had these heads of lettuce like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, and just how it was November, we had already been through, you know, several, several frost. And I, I just, when I, when I saw, I think it was like a skyfish lettuce or, or some just really exotic bib that you'll never see in the grocery store. And I was like, I want to grow that like that. This is what I want to do. And 
Uh, it was just, you know, him, him and Allison at, at the time. And I think Allison was working uh, full time teaching. So it was really just him. So, you know, they weren't really on any kind of big scale, but just the quality of his produce was just really fantastic. And then we had invited him to come down to our farm and essentially just get it started because, you know, this was back in the time where, you know, I, I had um, Elick Coleman's books, which were really fantastic, but I really needed some good, just practical direction for the southern climate. And, you know, we at that point, I had a wife, I had uh, two two young children. And I guess I, you know, being young, I didn't want to wait 20 years for me to figure this out. Like I was ready to figure it out like now. So like yesterday, like yesterday, <laughs> like, let's get the show on the road. So we invited him to to, to come down. And him and Allison came down for about two days and they kind of got us started in in kind of how to set up. We actually had one high tunnel set up and he helped us lay the whole thing out. I mean, just the seeds to buy, how to lay out the, the, the whole tunnel from the varieties to the timing, just everything. And that's about as far as we got. But that was about as much as my brain could handle, you know, in one one weekend. And then he also kind of got us set up on on the passion poultry because he was like, you know, hey, this is a this is something that, you know, you guys may want to think about. It's fairly easy to get going. It doesn't require a lot of, um, you know, infrastructure and cost in eight weeks from the time of chicks. You can actually have cash flow. And so we were like, you know, let's let's give that a shot. So we we did everything um, Paul had told us to do. We got um you know, all of our lettuce is done, our tomatoes and kale in the high tunnel when we did. And we had this um, high tunnel in the spring of 2010 that was just completely loaded with, with produce. And uh, a friend of mine had come by and he was like, you know, Ray, this, this is nice, but... Um, where are you going to sell this? I said, well, I haven't got that far. I'm just, I'm just too busy growing this stuff. And, uh, you know, his whole point was it's, uh, it's easy to grow, but it's a lot harder to sell. So we had called on to a, some, some farmers markets, just trying to figure out if there was room. Um, and during this time, I'm actually, you know, I've got a, um, I've got a basically a part to full-time job, um, doing some land maintenance. So this was kind of, you know, on the side. And um, so we had one market that, that was, you know, seemed pretty excited for us to come and just show up. And so we brought these heads of lettuce there. And those folks were so excited about seeing lettuce that they were like, as we were grabbing the boxes of lettuce from, from the truck, they were taken out of our hands. They said they had never seen lettuce like that in like 30 years. And we just we just clean house that it was our it was, it was our it was our first day um, at that market and so we were obviously very excited and we went you know there may be something here we knew that in order that we had a lot to learn as far as you know succession plantings and this was March and April which is the easiest part of the year to grow at least here in the south and you know we knew the the worst was yet to come and so we we. We did that March and April, and then, you know, since we weren't really on top of our game on the succession plantings and the spacing to really plant, you know, come, I think, May and June, we were basically out of product. Um, and it was, you know, and we, we had some stuff, but we had really still had no idea what we were doing. Uh, looking back, I wish I would have gone, you know, to a farm for at least one whole season just to see. There's a, a lot of things as a beginning farmer you just don't even think about, you know, of, of hey, you know, um, make sure you have your irrigation before June. Like it all needs to be set up, you know. Uh, there's just, there's just, you know, make sure that you're that you're switching your, you know, to your summer varieties, you know, in the end of end of April. So there's just a lot of these things that, um, you know, we just had to learn basically the, the, the hard way. After that experience with, you know, Paul just really helping set our spring basically market up, I realized the value of pursuing high grade education and, you know, really finding folks who knew what they were talking about and really trying to go and um, basically just asking for, for, for more help. And, 
you know, I, I wanted to be kind of like, you know, the guy who could just basically recreate the, the wheel for our area. But I just quickly realized that I did not want to wait that long. And so um, that, was, that, that whole time was just, uh, it was such an exciting time because, you know, uh, in 2009, when we were just dreaming about farming, um, you know, my wife and I, we were just like, you know, is it even possible for us to even make a living growing food and selling it and actually being on the land? You know, our children, you know, we, we, we wanted our, I wanted to be around for my children. Um, previously, I was driving four hours a day to Memphis and back. And I, you know, I, I wanted to be done with that life. After us talking in 2009 about this dream and then, you know, in March of 2010, just seeing like, wow, we got a high tunnel full of product. Customers are buying it. We, we were just we were just thrilled. We were really thrilled. And so from that point on, it was just really just a lot of um, terrible mistakes, a lot of disappoint the disappointments from. I think the 2010 was a massive heat wave and it happened to be the year that we started. Um, Paul Whitaker actually told us later on that year, he goes, man, that, that was the worst year I've ever had farming. And of course that was the first year we started. So we definitely got, (laughs) we got a great introduction to the realities and the not so fun things about farming here, here in the South. Little trial by fire. Oh my goodness! Yeah, li- almost literally. Um, the the ground just it was just baking. So, but at the end of the year, we had, you know, we 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 had gotten with Paul again. I actually went up to his farm this time, and basically had helped him pull up a bunch of tomatoes in tray for about two or three hours of just him sitting down with me, and I kind of had made some plans based off of some previous uh, failures and just, you know, we kind of had planned the fall. And so we actually had a a decent fall harvest, which was really encouraging. So at the end of that first year, um, I think we only made like $10,000 of that that first year. Um, Now, mind you, you know, I wasn't depending on the income. So it was basically, you know, in our spare time, you know, um, early, early mornings, afternoons and Saturdays. But it was enough where we felt like, you know what, I think with... You know, let's let's when we took the winter, we did some planning and uh, I think we visited some more farms. I went to a, a uh, the Southern Sog farming conference down here, which was and so just meeting some other farmers. We got encouraged and we were like, let's just try this again. So um, during that time, the um, the church that I'm involved with, we, we, we had this um, this young man who had gotten out of prison. And he needed, he'd been in prison for a while, so he needed help transitioning from, you know, prison life to the the real world. And it was definitely not going well for him. So they kind of asked if we would essentially take him on, hoping that him being connected to the land, you know, at that point, we, we, we had a few pigs that we gotten by accident that someone convinced me to get uh <laughs> <laughs> one of the worst things that ever happened to us no but um we we had said yep it'd be great to have a guy to help anyways you know just 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 to do basic chores and you know we we and i've known uh, this young man for a while you know since he was a a child so i kind of wanted to you know, if we can be a, a part of his, you know, turning point in life, then, then, you know, we're all for it. So he really loved animals a lot. And we had gotten a few pigs by mere accident. We, we had this one patch of ground, which I kind of failed to mention earlier, that was completely infested with Johnson grass and pigweed. And I don't know if you have those weeds up north, but down here, it's just, it'll just devastate you and it's to the point where you just cannot get rid of it it's these tubers that grow underground and you know when you dig one up it's just they just reproduce 10 more tubers it's just it's just a nightmare so we we get all the leaves from the city of selmer and they actually dump them on our farm and they were dumping them in the landfill they were paying the landfill you know 15 dollars per load and we were like you can dump them on our farm for free <laughs> and right. so they, they started doing that and then um 
a friend of mine had this idea because why don't we, you know, put some leaves on this field and why don't we get you some pigs? I'm like, no, I don't want any pigs, no pigs. They stink. Um, you know, I don't have the money to feed them for, you know, six months. And then what are we going to, where are we going to sell them? So we, you know, he talked me. And so we ended up getting two pigs and they did, I think we had a uh, portion off like this one eighth, one eighth of an acre section. And we put some leaves down and um, we put them down over the winter. And over the course of the winter, they got every Johnson grass tuber out of that one area. And we have yet since that time to have any Johnson grass can come back. And we were like, wow, this is incredible. Like there's, you know, there's actually maybe some hope. That was the other thing that I was unprepared for during our first year of farming was the weeds, like the incredible amount. Um, I just, I wish we could find a way to market all these weeds and sell them because it would just, it would really change the life of us farmers. But um, having those pigs that winter really was like, wow, what if we did this to all of our fields? We could like literally get rid of Johnson grass. So and then, um, you know, our our friend um, who was with us uh, for for the for, for that winter, you know, he just loved me. He's like, hey, man, I love these pigs. Can we get more? And and he he was he was like a pig whisperer. I mean, he just loved pigs. They loved him. They'd follow him around everywhere. They would they wouldn't come to me with a bucket hardly. He was so he definitely had a, a gift for animals. And seeing kind of how the animals changed him, you know, we just we got more animals. We got more pigs. And then he's like, hey, what about some cows? So we got some cows, and then we got some chickens. And and the next thing you know, um, we got all these animals. And then we're like, you know, what are we gonna do with all these animals? <laughs> so. So we kind of started getting the word out and then got to find out that there's actually a pretty big demand for, you know, pastured animals. And, you know, our friend here is doing a great job. He's actually mellowing out as a person um, and just the, the land is benefiting. Just everybody's benefiting. So we end up just kind of since we kind of had the demand and I, I had the um, the space for the animals. And we also had some adjoining pastures. We just end up getting more and more animals. And we found that we could be a lot more consistent with our with our meat sales than we could with our produce sales. You know, it's you know, whenever you harvest a head of lettuce, like you've got, you know, three days at max to sell it where, you know, when you have a pork in the freezer, it can be there for five months. And uh, so anyway, so all those combined, that's kind of how we got really carried away into the whole meat business. And in the meantime, we we started a vegetable CSA. And I personally have lo always loved growing vegetables more than I did the the the, the actual animals. Um, and so we we uh, were, we had access to a tractor. And then I got some just really basic cultivating equipment. We got a plastic mulch later, which really helped with our weeds. And so we just we just started growing more and more produce outside. We just started doing a lot more, you know, uh, tomatoes, a lot more lettuce, really big fall crops, really big spring crops, some some a little overwinter stuff, and it just kind of grew and grew. Our biggest problem with with the with those two things is I just I could not. It, I felt like I really had nothing under control. Like I really never had the animals under control to a point where I felt really good about, you know, their health, the land's health, um, not being stressed about, well, you know, how are we going to pay for, for feed or how are we going to pay this thousand dollar processing bill? And then at the same time, like when I needed to be planting, because it's a beautiful day to plant or work in the fields, I was processing chicken. So I just yep. really struggle that personally. And it's just probably because of, I'm just, you know, wasn't wired to do both. And um, so we found to keep up with our product for our produce production, you know, which is kind of, you know, just backwards now looking back at it is definitely a foolish way to think, but I just felt like I had to have so much land and cultivation because I was having so much crop loss failures that I had to grow 
twice as much just to make up for all the all the losses. So then I, it, it's, it's just like this never ending vicious cycle of failures, just week after week and year after year of going, what am I doing here? You know, <laughs> and so. Um, yeah, it just got to the point where it was just insanity. It was just insanity. Um, and, and I think, I think a person can do, I think a farmer can, can be really good if all they do is just meet, you know, animals and maybe have a small vegetable garden for their family. Or, you know, if, if, or, uh, you know, a farmer could have just produce and maybe a small, you know, flock of chicken for their personal use. But to do both on a scale that is financially successful and that you have some kind of quality of life, uh, I, I failed miserably at it. You know, we just we just yeah. cannot do it. So that was our experience. And, and uh, we have yet to actually meet someone who can do both. I'm sure they're out there. I just haven't met them yet. Who actually do both on some kind of substantial scale who have a good quality of life and who are making decent money. There's no one in our area. Well, and I think it's a real challenge unless you get to a scale where you can begin to delegate some of those responsibilities. That's right. And 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 you can delegate. There's this hard place of to get good labor, you have to pay for it. You, you have right. to first find the guy and you have to have the money to kind of take that risk of we just, we just never got there. You know, we just we just we just never got there. So, well, and you, I mean, part of that, you have to have that right combination of right markets, land yes. to be able to yes. scale up. Um, yes. And, and, the, and the capital, you know, so that you really can, like you say, you can bring in somebody good. You can, you can afford to bring in somebody good and you can set it to them with enough attention that they can do a good job. You know, That's it's one, right. you know, one of the mistakes I oftentimes see with people when they bring in somebody to, to quote unquote, manage a certain part of the operation is there, they think, well, okay, great. So they're going to, this person is going to be like me, right? They're going to just manage it in their spare time. Like I've been managing the greenhouse in my spare time. And, and, but now they're also supposed to be part of the harvest crew and part of the packing crew. Instead of saying like, okay, I'm going to bring this person in and I'm going to dedicate their time to doing a really good job at this one thing. Right. You know, and I oh, think yeah. that requires, that requires a different scale. Absolutely. Yes, you are so right. And, and we found out, too, that we actually kind of hit this ceiling of how much meat we could actually sell at, at a price that made financial sense. And then it was, it was like this point of, you know, do we go to Nashville? You know, do we do we you know, it, then it just gets it just got so complicated, you know. And so during all that time around the the this the winter of 2015, we had really kind of sat down and we really made this like this is like the first year that we actually I was full time um, by then. And we were very grateful to be farming full time, not making a very good living, but we were at least, you know, we were doing doing what we were, you know, our what our dream was. So we had made this really incredible plan for the animals, for the produce. We were going to scale up our, our produce CSA. We were, you know, this was going to kind of be the year that we we're going to really hopefully be able to afford to take someone on. Um, and really, uh, we've gotten, you know, our, our processing facility, um, built finally for our chickens and we got the equipment we needed. We still needed a few things for that, but it, it was definitely going smooth. We, we had a huge demand for, for our CSA. And so we were going to really scale that up. So we just really mapped out our plan. So we, you know, uh, I think it was, it was March. So we, in March of 2015, we had just our greenhouse was just loaded with plants. You know, we're getting ready to get our, our fields ready. Uh, we're fixing to order our first batch of chicks. And I was working out in the field by the high tunnel. And um, our daughter had some issues with, 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 um, with one of her teeth. And uh, got some of her teeth pulled out, but it, like, it never healed. And it was just getting worse and worse. And so she took her to the, to the doctor. And she came home one day and, you know, so, you know, mind you, this is early March greenhouse is loaded. 
uh, we're fixing to get into the fields. We're really excited about the season. And she said, are you ready? Uh, are you ready for your life to, to, to completely change? I said, come on, we're farmers. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, bring it on. Right. And, uh, she said, our daughter has a uh, cancer. And I was like, what? <laughs> Cause yeah, she, she has squamous cell carcinoma. And we were just in, you know, she was six years old at the time, you know, and we've, we've, you know, since she was one, um, we really tried to, to eat well. So it was an, a huge blow to, uh, to our family for sure. And, you know, without question, you know, the, the first thing we're going to do is, is take care of our daughter. Um, and so that begun this serious, at least for me personally, and really taking a hard look at what I'm doing in my life, because now we're faced with this reality of like, you know, you know, this is stage four. It, it was basically in the bone, just millimeters away from the main vein that was going to go to, to, to her brain. And basically any day that once it got to that, to that main, um, vein, you know, sensory vein, then it was basically nothing you could do at that point. Um, and I just had a friend who's my age who died like six months earlier from the same cancer. So it, it was, it was definitely not something a parent wants to hear. Um, but we, we, we just went, okay, you know, um, we can either, <laughs> we can, um, you know, we can, we can either, you know, be in the pits about this or just find out. It was really interesting, Chris, about a week or two after just like, what are we going to do with the farm? How are we going to make a lit? Like, you know, I don't have a savings account. Like, you know, my savings account is, you know, in the greenhouse, <laughs> like every right. dime is in there. You know, we, we, and we had already uh, sold a lot of CSAs and their money is like in the fertilizer and, and, you know, plastic and plants and potting soil and propane and, you know, everything that a begin a farm needs in spring. Like, that's, that's where you need all your money. So that was already spent. So we had, you know, probably 50 CSA members, I would say at that point. And, you know, we were hoping for, for even more. And so, um, you know, as a provider, I'm like, okay, um, you know, just think, okay, how, how is this going to like, this is, you know, it just, it wasn't looking good on, on every aspect of is the farm over for good? Do I have to go get a job? Is my daughter going to live? I mean, that was obviously our first concern was, is she going to survive another week? And, um, and being there for my wife, we had, you know, four, we had a four month old baby at that time that was nursing. So that was, oh, I mean, it was, it was crazy. Um, but I remember thinking, um, and it took me a few weeks to get to this place of, you know, we just in and out of the doctors, just, just trying to figure out what we're going to do. I'm calling every, you know, um, holistic cancer center in the country, you know, that I can know of, of what to do with this cancer. And they're all like, you know, do not mess around with this cancer. You know, it's, a uh, it's just nasty. So I just remember coming to this place of, you know, I, I actually feel like as bad as this whole situation is, and there's nothing good about it whatsoever, that I really felt like something good was going to come. I really did. And I just had that belief and hope that, you know, God was really in control. Um, you know, he gives and he takes away and we're, we're going to find and look for the best possible outcomes of the situation. And I think when I got to that point, I was, I mean, I wasn't okay. Like I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Um, it was, it was not an easy time, but I, I had a lot more hope and belief that everything was going to work out no matter, no matter this, like what the outcome was going to be. It was, we were going to all be, be better because of it. Basically, we were basically sent to, to St. Jude, which is a major na international children's cancer hospital. 
and it just so happened we were two hours away. So that was a huge blessing. So we, um, we basically opted for, for surgery, which was their recommendation. And what they were going to do is basically her whole lower jawbone had to be completely removed the whole thing because of the cancer had spread so fast. Um, and even like in the, in, in the two weeks that we had waited between all the doctor visits, like when, so when we first got the diagnosis to the time that we actually went in for surgery, it had just spread so fast. It was just, I mean, it was, it was a miracle that we, we, we took her in at the time we did. And, um, you know, they they took basically her whole half of her jaw out and took a piece of her lower leg bone. I think it's called the fibula. It was about a six inch piece and they grafted it in there. I don't know how they do what they do, but it, it was a 14 hour surgery. And uh, it was definitely one of the longest, longest days of our life. Um, and, you know, because there was no promise of, of, of really any outcome. Um, it was just right. she what they told us she was the youngest person on record to have squamous cell carcinoma and just squamous oh. cell carcinoma. So everyone knows it's it's a really common gum and and jaw disease that older men g- get from drinking um you know, lots of uh, liquor and smoking tobacco their whole life. So that that's right. it's very common in all the men. But they said it was the youngest patient they ever saw. So it was actual a, a reportable case. So we were in the hospital for 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 two weeks. Um, and, you know, we were in um, ICU for for several days. And, you know, during that time, I just really had a lot of the time to just think and just reflect on, OK, you know, we have, you know, four children now, you know, our life is now over. My wife is fixing to become full time nurse here. Here I was. I've spent the better part of the previous four years being so consumed with the farm day and night. And I went, you know, in the end, in the end of a day, you know, most men, you know, when, when we're on our deathbed, we don't need a successful farm. We don't need lots of land. We don't need a big house, shiny cars. What we desire is our families to be with us. And, um, it, it was a real big wake up call for me of making sure that I'm, I'm not just around, but I'm really have the energy and time to be with my family. To be present. You know, you're so right. Uh, just because you're in the house on the computer emailing doesn't mean you're not being with your family. You know, you're so now, you know, so since that time, it's just really like, like you know, it's like everything came in perspective, like what is really important. And yes, we love farming and it's our living and we love it and we, we want to provide good food to the community. But if I'm not around for my family, I've gained absolutely nothing. And so it, it just hit home really, really hard. And so I knew when we left that hospital that we were going to make some changes. Um, and... You know, and so, and uh, yeah, and it was an amazing, it, it was, you know, Chris, it was actually the best thing that, that ever happened to us. We completely changed our health. We did just a really uh, pretty radical, uh, you know, food turnover. Um, you know, we ended up getting like an infrared sauna. We got a really good juicer, so we're doing a lot of juicing. We all, the whole family changed our diet. So instead of, you know, telling our daughter, hey, you know, Asha, you know, you can't have this food. Like we all, the whole family did it together. And it really brought us close. And uh, my wife and I were, you know, we're um, not old, but we're, we're not 18 anymore. And so we were starting to have some health issues. And just within a matter of months, I mean, our health just completely turned around. 
you know, all of a sudden I can, I can actually get up early in the morning. I have energy. Um, so, you know, so there's the health aspects that came with that. Um, you know, and to, to, to just say something real quick about our, our, the, the whole CSA, <clears throat> you know, kind of movement and, and that, and that family, you know, when we were in the, in the hospital, I think we went in the hospital for the surgery, like the week or so when our CSA was supposed to start. So we told them, you know, because we didn't know how long we were going to be in there. So we told them that, you know, guys, we're going to have to cancel our CSA this spring and we're really sorry. We unfortunately do, do not have the cash to give your money back, but we will give you a gift card, you know, or we'll, we'll give you a summer CSA if we do one. But for now, we'll, we'll just give you at least a gift card that's, you know, equal to that amount. 90% of the people said, do not worry about it. Like, we don't want, we don't want any, we don't want money back. We don't want no gift card. It, it was incredible, the, the support that we got. Um, you know, we ended up kind of doing a fundraiser just basically to help kind of uh, raise some funds for just her actual medical, medical needs and some, some things that we needed to get for her. And just the amazing response that we got from our, you know, local and even just, you know, national, you know, farming friends that we've made. So there's something to say with the farming community, you know, when there's, when a need arises, it's, it's pretty incredible. And we, we just felt very blessed to to experience that, Uh, you know, lots of time you're on the other, either giving in and to be on the receiving end is never fun, but I was very humbled and was very grateful to be a part of such a great, a great community and family. So when, when, when we came home from that whole thing, we were just like, okay, what are we going to do? You know, first thing is, you know, Ashley, you know, you're no longer on the farm. You know, there's a lot of needs that, you know, our daughter still had, uh, for, for those next, next few months. Um, it was, it was a pretty uh, traumatic, um, surgery for her and, and for us. And so through that summer, we, we, we didn't do a CSA. We just did farmers markets and we just basically, you know, and my wife and I, we talked about, should I go get a job or should we keep farming? And we both decided that I think if we were to make some radical changes that we, in the end, we love the farming lifestyle. We just, we need to not do what we've been doing for the past four years. So yeah, just some, some major changes had to happen. So um, around that time, you know, I found your podcast, you know, and I, I heard, uh, you know, Jean Martin on there, uh, no tractors, you know, doing really well on an acre and a half. And I don't know how many times I listened to that podcast, but um, <laughs> uh, we ended up getting the book and I'd listen to more of your podcast. I, I found some, uh, the podcast on Curtis Stone. And I just remember being out there like in June, July, you know, by myself, you know, waiting for the rain to stop to get out in the field with the tractors, just going, you know what? I, 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 I was really honest with myself and went, I am not cut out for this tractor work. I'm not a mechanic. I'm not mechanically inclined. I don't, you know, I'm really having a hard time getting all my space. I just was not, I just wasn't having fun, having fun at all. And then, and then during that time, you know, one of the things that we cut out of our diet was, was, was pork. Okay. Cause you know, porks don't sweat. And so they, you know, sweating, you know, and you know, it's, it's one of the healthiest, we, one of the healthiest things we can do to eliminate toxins. So, uh, we got on this really kind of strict protocol. So we we're no longer eating pork. And so here I am raising these 50 hogs that are getting out that are, you know, that are stinking and I can't get them to the processing facility. And, you know, my freezers are breaking and we can't eat the meat. And I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> like, this is not fun either. And I, I had found that, um, you know, kind of podcast on Curtis Stone and really just started doing a lot of research on like, you know what? Maybe you don't have to use a tractor after all, um, a lot of the folks in the Mid-South say it's impossible to farm there in the Mid-South without a tractor. So that's kind of what I was led to believe. And here I am hearing other growers. Now, mind you, they're in, they're in Canada. But I just went, this may be possible. 
And so I think it was like June or July. I'm out there. It's blasting hot. And I just remember going, I would love to not have to deal with trackers anymore. Is is there a way? So I, I had reached out. I thought, you know what? I would love to get JM down here to the farm and just... You know, half a day of, you know, I've, I've, I've you know, and I, and I did read the book said, and that was very good. But there were just some things like, you know, JM, have you ever seen these weeds in the South? Like, you know, the weed never dies. The bugs never die. It is just brutal down here. Um and so I, I really had had some some serious doubts about it worked really working in the South. And then I started, uh, you know, kind of score corresponding back and forth to him about the possibility of him coming down in the fall. And he seemed very open to it. And so I was kind of telling some of my other farmer friends here in the Mid-South, I'm like, dude, the only way you can make money, set, you know, on, 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 you know, that kind of money on one acre is, uh, is maybe weed. And I don't know if you know, but it, it's not legal in Tennessee yet. <laughs> so there was a lot of kickback on there's impossible. There's no way those guys up north are just full, full of baloney. And I went, well, um, you know, let, why don't we get them down here? So we, we ended up hiring a jam to come down to do a, a two, two day um, workshop. And a lot of it uh, what, you know, what kind of stemmed this direction was I just felt like I felt like these guys who were farming on a just one acre or less had a lot more time to do other things than just farm. And that was the very thing that I was really looking for. Like I was looking for a major change in our, in our family. And so I, I had this hope that, you know what, this may be possible, you know, but I'm like, I'm not ready to get rid of the meat. Like I put too much money into it, too much time it just ain't happening. And, um, we end up getting uh, jam to come down and, you know, we end up, um, s selling tickets to help kind of, uh, cover the cost. And we also, a lot of the farmers in our area, we've lost a lot of family farms. Just, it's really hard climate to grow in. It's the, the customers are, you know, 20 years behind, um, say California and, you know, New England. And there's just a lot of things going against. So we were really saddened by that. And like, well, why don't we bring in some, some kind of outside perspective on maybe we can all change our growing, um, you know, systems and, and maybe become better farmers and, and have just better lives. So we, we end up opening tickets so that they would come, but we end up having more more of a national uh, people coming from all over the country instead. And so um, it's, just, it's very interesting how that all kind of works. After that time, um, you know, seeing him on the farm and was, was really, really helpful. And then I also was kind of talking back and forth to Curtis Stone and finally um, started doing some consulting with him. And then during that time, we realized, well, you know, like Curtis had asked us, hey, is it possible that you guys are doing too much? And Ashley's over there like nodding her head. Yes, we are. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't know. I, th I, th I think we can handle it. <laughs> but, you know, after that phone call, we both just went, what if we just did produce? That's that's all we eat anyways. We hardly eat any meat anymore. We love growing greens. We can never grow enough greens. So the market is there. We're not having fun doing meat. We just need to sell it. And it just so happened that Caleb Kernelin, who was a... Um, you know, one of Joel Salatin managers for two years, he was moving back home to Jackson about an hour away North. And we, you know, we had befriended him a few, few years past. And, you know, so we called him and said, Hey, we, we have a market, we have the animals, we have infrastructure. Do you want the business? And he said, yes. So we just hand the whole thing to him. And when we did that, Chris, I had this weight off of me that I just cannot explain. It felt so good to let something go.
I remember the day that the sheep left my farm and just, it was, <laughs> right. it, it was sad, but it was also just a tremendous feeling of relief. Like that. I just wasn't going to have to deal with that tomorrow. It was amazing. The fact that I don't have to, you know, keep the pigs water from freezing in the winter anymore. I just, man, it was, it was incredible. So yeah, so last year that was like, so 2016 was our first year of just doing produce and it was a risk. So like we basically sold 75% of our, of our income, like gone. 75% 75% of your gross income, About right? Gross, not net. <laughs> gross. And I think that's, I mean, and, and, and so what, right? And so what? Exactly. So, man, we made some hard things of going, okay, um, we're going to this year, we're going to, we're going to get rid of half of the crops we grow. We're going to only grow on one acre. We're getting rid of the tractor and we're going to set time. Like we're not, we're, we're going to go, we are done, you know, at four o'clock we're done no matter what, unless obviously like, you know, we're, we're packing orders and we have, you know, a, a, a few more heads to package, which only happened twice last year. Um, but in general, like we're going to set really strict uh, perimeters on our work week and it, it just, it changed our life. We actually, in August of last year, we actually took a week off for vacation. We went up North and cooled off in Minnesota and we actually had money to do it. We didn't have to worry about, you know, what if the pigs get overheated? What if our help doesn't water the chickens? It was incredible. And we had such a fun time last year, made the most money we ever made in our life. Um, and my wife really enjoyed just doing the, 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 the vegetables. Our kids enjoyed it. You know, um, it's a lot safer than, you know, being around tractors and you're always, you know, wondering, okay, is my, is my two year old, you know, going to be underneath my wheel? So many things changed last year that just made it very, very enjoyable. And, and our, our lives just, they'll, they'll, they'll never, never be the same. So awesome. that's kind of a long story of to go, you know, it was definitely a tragedy, you know, that happened, but we really, you know, um, I think human nature, um, it's very easy to be, get caught up in the, you know, what was me and why did this happen to me? And, you know, uh, and just start going downhill. And, um, it, it's, it's tough, tough to, to, to get out of that place. Um, but you know, when we did and we went, okay, what, you know, we, we just, we knew that something was going to change and we were looking for it. And it, you know, once we saw the changes and we embraced the change, it was just, I, I just, you know, we will never go back. We don't even own a cat, you know, just no animals. I mean, we're just like hardcore. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure as our kids get old, I'm going to want some more animals, but, um, so we had a good time last year. We're having a great time this year. And that, that, that's kind of our, our, uh, our short story of, of how, you know, we got from failing as farmers to actually loving life. So Ray, right now is, I think is a good time for us to take a break, get a couple words from our sponsors. When we come back, I really want to talk to you about kind of the nuts and bolts about how you, how you made this work. I mean, this is a big journey and a lot of changes. And I want to, I really want to dig into some of the details about how you actually transformed your farm and your life at the real, you know, right down at the runway level. Sounds great. Perennial support for the farmer to farmer podcast is provided by Vermont compost company. Hey, Ray, I noticed on Instagram that you use Vermont compost company's potting soil. Is there something about their product that works especially well for you and that makes you want to use it in your lettuce production? I love Vermont compost and all their products. We went from one year to having the hardest time getting our lettuce transplants coming out of our plugs. The moment we switched, every plug popped out with ease and completely changed our lettuce production system. So we love Vermont compost and would really highly recommend every farmer to consider trying it out. That's awesome. And I couldn't say it better myself. Vermont Compost Company, taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. 
VermontCompost.com. And by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers. And with PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, log splitters, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a new water transfer pump, you've got the tools that you need to get the jobs done across the farm and across the homestead. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions for mowing and tilling before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, the BCS tackled jobs that we couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Plus, they're gear-driven for years of dependable service. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. All right, and we're back with Ray Tyler from Rose Creek Farms in Selmer, Tennessee. During the first part of the show, you really described this this kind of incredible journey of going from, I mean, A, not farming to then farming right. and 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 going kind of crazy with it. Yes. And then really, you know, prompted by this this health crisis with your daughter, turning things around and getting control of your farm, you know, and and I. I, I I always love to talk about management, you know, and that the things that aren't managed tend towards chaos. And I don't care whether it's whether it's your teenager's bedroom or right. your or your farm or your bank account. You've right. gotta, you know, you've gotta manage. Absolutely. And, and otherwise things things well, you know, entropy, right? That's right. So what I want to dig into here in the second half of the show is is how did you guys go about actually making these changes? Because it's one thing to say, oh yeah. You know, we're not going to work after four o'clock in the afternoon and we're going to, you know, get rid of all the tractors. But mm. like how? I mean, how does that actually work to go from being a crazy farmer in 2015 to. To run in a BCS instead of tractors and quit and work at four. Right. So right. I'm going to start with, I guess, the specific question I want to start with is, I mean, just talk to me about about going the production methods. So you went from doing things with the tractor on a couple acres, having cultivating tractors. And then you, you did what, what kind of equipment did you switch to and how did you make that change? So what we ended up doing is we to kind of go back a little bit. So we, we spent about 10 hours with, with, with Curtis Stone around there somewhere. And it was, you know, cause I had a lot of questions. I had a lot of, you know, I'm very skeptical. So if you're going to say something like, I, I want to see it work, you know, I want to, I want to hear it really explained and I want to challenge it. I want to challenge what you're saying in my context, because everybody has different context of the other farms. And, you know, we've never seen, at least in our area, this kind of farming and all my farmer friends are telling me this is impossible. So I have a lot of doubts. So we did spend about 10 hours with Curtis, just really talking about the nuts and bolts of, you know, what we're doing and then also going, okay, so, you know, you're in, in our context. Um, I kind of have really heavy soil. So I wanted to go the BCS route. I actually had a BCS that I just never used. And so I, I just, I like the BCS. Um, you know, we, we, we have our, our beds do not drain very well. So I wanted to have the actual raised beds to get my crops out of the water. So we just talked a lot about that. We also talked about like our sales. And so he, you know, we talked about what I, what I thought was possible as far as numbers. And, and so we just kind of worked that way. So what we did is we got, you know, so I already had a BCS tractor. So I bought the whole kit, the whole BCS, you know, flail mower, the Berta plow, which we don't really use anymore. The power harrow, which is an incredibly fast, efficient tool. And so we ended up uh, buying that through, um, I think BCS has some kind of credit program that you can do with them. So we're able to, to, to finance that. And, you know, and we also, one of the other practical things too, is I was really getting tired of laying plastic with the tractor. It just, it's just, you know, the plastic is stuck in the soil and you leave plastic behind. And again, since I was a terrible tractor farmer, I can never get it all up. And so, you know, we talked about the landscape fabric, which I'm a big user of landscape fabric. Probably won't always be, but the what what had happened with the weeds? This was a this was actually actually I think weeds are the number one 
cause for for farms to fail that and and not having the right sales you know down here we it's so hard to control and then the last four years of farming i just could not tell you how many flushes of pigweed i went to seed and literally i had like you know the weed it was just like you know it was just like you know doomsday out here it's just it, it was hopeless cause of even getting a start so we invested well, and i just i actually want to i want to lay in on that a little bit just on the weeds because this is actually one of my pet peeves on farms is is i don't think that a lot of people understand especially beginning farmers just how devastating oh. the weeds are oh it'll kill you Right, because not only is it going to reduce your airflow, which increases your crop disease and it's robbing your nutrients and it's robbing the water that's in the soil, but it just makes everything hard. The harvest just gets hard. hard, Like everything. Walking, like, you know, we we used to, like, we did tomatoes, you know, we would harvest tomatoes. I mean, the weeds in the paths were like two feet tall. And you're out there in the morning, your legs are soaked. It's, listen, having... You know, if if you want to enjoy life on a farm, get rid of all your weeds, just, you know, and whatever that takes, you, you can't have any. So this was one thing that we really hit on with Curtis was the whole weed pressure. So where we came to was for the first couple of years, while we get a handle on everything else, and I don't like pulling weeds, is that we did, if, if it was a tra- if it was a transplanted crop, we were doing landscape fabric paths everything and i think we spent 20 hours last year weeding really and listen i don't know how many hours we weeded the year before and how many crops we lost to the weeds it, i mean i just can't i just cannot tell you the night and day difference you know i love you know i i think we will get our our seed bank under control in the next year or two maybe less um we're already seeing a dramatic difference just by not letting last year's seed go you know uh, weeds go to seed tremendous difference so by doing landscape fabric you know, we did a lot of, you know, bed prep, tarping, and then, you know, getting the tarp off. We let the seeds come up even more and then flame weed that. Just really being aggressive about that. And the landscape fabric is what what is what changed the game for us. You know, mind you, it is a hassle to play down and to take up. But in between, there, there's just no weeds. You know, and th- there will be a few weeds that will go up around your plant, but it doesn't take, it's not nothing compared to kind of be out there with a hoe at four o'clock in the afternoon when you get all your work done, when it's, you know, almost 100 degrees and 85% humidity in August. That is not fun. So for us, you know, putting on landscape fabric was very enjoyable compared to what we were doing in, in the years past. So that was a big nut and bolt difference in what like we had tremendous, tremendous yield. Um, a matter of fact, I couldn't even sell all the, all the crop that I grew, which was a kind of an, an, another, another problem. Um, that really? were, so, it was unbelievable. So, wait, so you guys, you guys cut the amount of vegetables that you were growing or, or the acres that you were growing on in half, in half. And you, and you still had, and, and you had more vegetables than you could sell. Listen, even listen. The year before. 2015, on two acres with a tractor, we grossed, just on the produce alone, around $40,000. Last year, by getting the weeds under control and having more product, because, you know, it didn't go to weeds, and we went, we were just more... We were in control of the situation. So I think we, we did, we grossed $120,000 last year on half the amount of land. So, um, sorry, that's, that's, that's where the transcript's going to read stunned silence. Right. <laughs> we were stunned. And we're no longer working 12, 16 hours a day. We've left the farm for a week in August. It was it was a life changing year for us. 
And mind you, there's still lots of problems, you know, mainly on, okay, you know, overproducing. And so what are we gonna do with all this product? And so we're, or, you know, there's, or, you know, some of the problems we had is, you know what? Um, they bought kale in 2015, but why isn't anyone buying it in 2016? So, you know, some of those things are just, it's just part of the business part of any business. Yeah, really. You know, if, if, if you're not always, if, if a farmer isn't looking for his next sale, it's just a matter of time before he's going to go out of business. You all, you got to be on top of it. So the weeds was for us was number one, getting that under control. And also another thing that really helped our cash flow was in our area, it's very saturated with peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, okra, squash, zucchini. And there's no way that we could really compete on one acre with all those guys who have, you know, farmers here who have 25 acres of this stuff. So we decided to do the one thing that no one wanted to do in the summer, and that was lettuce. We have a really good market for lettuce because no one grows it in the summer. And so we really put a lot of time and effort and thought in how can we, you know, pick the varieties for lettuces, the spacing, the water, the shade, like, you know, how can we keep this stuff cranking all through July and August? And so that really helped because we had really solid cash flow through those months, which, you know, June, uh, July, August, and September are one of the lean months down here in, in, in the South because the only stuff that can really grow well is a lot of your just common, um, very cheap to grow vegetables. So by right. entering into the salad business, doing the one thing that no farmer in our area is willing to do or try, we made it, made it happen. So how are you growing lettuce in the middle of the summer then? What are you doing to make that work? Because because are you talking about like salad mix or are you talking about head lettuce? Both. Both. Okay. Yep. Yep. Both. So like, you know, we had this one restaurant account that wants, you know, a hundred pounds of salad mix every week, all year round. Um, another uh, wholesale group wanted like last year, they wanted 425 heads of head lettuce every single week all summer. And that's good. You know, at $250 to 250 ahead, you know, it's not as good as retail, but it's every week. Like that, that was a nice, that was a nice um, paycheck that helped with our infrastructure and labor and all that. So, yeah. So why, what I can do is I'll just kind of walk through kind of the basic steps of what we do in the summer. Number one is germination of lettuce seed. Very hard to do in the summer because of the heat. So we pick heat tolerant varieties and then we're planting, you know, we're seeding the greenhouse. It goes in a walk-in cooler for 48 hours. It comes out in the eve in the afternoon, evening. And, um, that we can almost have just about 85 to 90% germination rate, which is really good. Cause we used to get like 30. So you're seeding in flats, watering them in, and then putting them in your walk-in cooler. That's right. That's right. And yes, you know, it does sound excessive amount of work, but when that is literally like that's, you know, we, we sell, that is the, it's probably 60 to 70% of our, our income is lettuce. So when that is the bulk of your income, you know, you'll do whatever it takes to make it happen. Then that goes in a greenhouse, you know, on a, a shaded greenhouse for about two, three weeks. And then the last five days, we, t we put them outside to kind of get hardened off to the heat so to speak. Um, I know it's common to do that in the early spring, but believe it or not, they, there's a better uh, survival if you can put those transplants in the sun because you're fixing to put them out in the field where it's relentless. And so having that three to four day period, that really helps um, kind of get them immune and ready for the heat. And then right. we use drip tape and overhead both. So what we're doing is we're turning on the drip tape. We're getting the, the, the beds completely soaked. The lettuce just goes right in there. And mind you, like, you know, down here, come eight, nine o'clock, it's, it's pushing 90 degrees already. And the sun is just 
you know, it's just blasting. So it's important that it gets water as soon as possible. And so by planting in a wet bed really helps for the water. And then as soon as we're done, we have overhead irrigation, which we have on a timer, um, three cycles a day at 15 minutes per cycle. And one of those we tried to aim for early in the night, which helps cool off the plant and the beds. I feel like um, it's important for lettuce. It needs to cool down for, you know, three or four hours at least without the sun to really help kind of recover from, from the heat stress. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I'm just telling you from experience what seems to really work for us. When, when we started doing that, you know, three cycles a day and then, you know, doing one in the evening just to kind of cool off the lettuce and the ground, we really had much, much better success with the lettuce not going bitter. And are you doing that throughout the growth cycle or is that just, is that just what you're doing when you're establishing the plants? All, yeah. The, the, the growth cycle. So we'll start, we'll actually probably start that. Um, I mean, it's been hot here, but not like the crazy 90 degrees at 10 o'clock in the morning, hot. Um, so we'll start here in the next week or two. We'll actually start that, that, um, that rotation of water till the end of August. And another thing that we have found, too, is that lettuce, if you can get lettuce, if it can survive the first seven to 10 days of its growing life, then you've half the battle is won. Um, so what we've also started to do for the first two weeks after we plant is we'll put shade cloth, like a 50% shade cloth over it. And that just helps that with the water and all the things that I mentioned, it just helps really get it off to a good start. And then for the last week and a half, two weeks of its, you know, of its time, because in the summer, you know, in four weeks, you know, a transplant will actually yield a whole head of lettuce ready to sell. Then we'll take off the shade cloth because I feel like the lettuce under the shade cloth for the whole life tends to not be as dense. Like it's stretching yep. to get more light. And so what we found is as long as you keep the water to it and you're doing heat varieties and all those things are happening, it does just fine. I mean, last summer was a nasty summer. And I'm going to give you a perspective like last September we tracked it. There was not one single day in the month of September that was under 90 degrees. You're kidding me. It was insane. Like normally, you know, by the second week of September, we're in the seventies, you know, and then it climbs on down to the sixties. It was insane. It was just really, really bad. And, you know, it just, it, it works for us. It, I'm not saying that this is going to work for everyone else. Everyone else's context is different. Your soil type, but that really worked for us really, really well on the farm. And that, you know, that's, that's huge. Um, we were doing a Salanova, which is not as big of a yielder as, um, the other seasons, but you know, when you have a high paying, uh, customer, it's, it's worth the effort. We're actually, um, we just started last week. We're going to actually start doing salad mix. We've got a, a certain um, mixture of salad mix we're going to actually do in paper pots. Because what we found in the, when, when you plant greens like arugula and baby mustard and those things in the paper pot, this is like on the two inch cell, really heavy, seven, six to seven rows per bed of the paper pot. It's ready to harvest from the time you train. So from the time you transplant to the time you harvest, it's like a two week window. So it's really quick. And so you can do a lot of rapid turnovers and it's not in the field as long. So you, the, we just have a much better um, germination rate and also it's not as bitter and tough because it's hadn't been out in the field as long. So we're, we've been really excited about uh, implementing that. And so um, that's really worked for us on greens this you know early summer. And we're, we're, we're fixing to scale up really heavy for our, for our salad mix. When you're doing that with those paper pot transplants and, and you're putting in, you know, they're growing for a couple of weeks out in the field and you're pulling them back out again. Are you pulling the paper out as well before you put in the next succession? We we're, we're going to start doing that. Mm -hmm. we, we were we were lightly, um, you know, using the power hero and then we would just rake it all up. 
but now mind you whenever we seed in the paper pots we're seeding that in the in the greenhouse right you're seeding in indoors and then and then putting the paper doing the paper pot or the paper chain transplanters outdoors right that's right that's right yep 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 and so for greens to mind you you know and if you're if you're in a cooler climate and you can germinate those green seeds fine then it's not it's not worth the trouble for sure it's just only in right. our context because we can we have such a demand for greens that we were, were willing to take the cost of the paper pot and the greenhouse space for very consistent and reliable, you know, stands of greens. Well, and of course, with the kinds of weed control challenges that you oh, guys have as well, oh, yeah. I mean, being able to have a crop in the ground for two weeks instead two of four, weeks. that Huge. actually makes a big difference huge it's huge it's you know these are the the small things that you know implied on a very small farm can really make a huge difference in the efficiency on how much time you're out there you know pulling out weeds and yeah it's just it's it's for us, it's really, you know, this is the practical things like these small changes that really. So, you know, since, you know, instead of competing with squash, you know, with the other farmers who are just almost giving them away. Why don't we put a little bit of extra thought, streamline our systems, really start analyzing and criticizing how we're doing things and and trying to grow things in a way that really just make, you know, financial sense. And I think growing those things that the other people aren't growing, is such an important idea, right? I mean, you show up at market and instead of looking at what's there, you look at what's not there. Right. You know, mind you, uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, that the time, you know, competition is coming, which I'm, I'm a big fan of competition. It, it keeps us on our toes, but if you're in a new, you know, you're in a, an area that has no, no one who's doing greens, you know, that's a huge opportunity, just huge. And I mean, everybody is eating salads right now. Just salads are just, everybody loves a salad. So how many people do you have working on the farm with you, Ray? So this year we, um, <clears throat> you know, after last year it was just mainly my wife and I, and we, um, actually it was just mainly me. And we, we had some other, um, part-time like high school help, which were great folks, but we saw the need for reliable, really driven, um, labor. And people who really care, not that they didn't care, but there is a difference between a 28 year old and a 16 year old, believe it or not. So this year, because last year, like we could have done way better on our sales if we would have had someone who could have really done the, the, the plantings, the, the bed prep, you know, I'm delivering our product to Memphis. It's two hours away. So I'm doing a lot of, a lot more delivering than I would like to be. Um, right. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to, um, once we get a few more stuff uh, established, I'm hoping that we can hire a driver, which is definitely, definitely in, in the works. We came to realize that paying someone even $15 an hour to do so many succession plantings would have made us a lot of money. So it was a hard step. So this year we actually got a full-time um, helper. He's, you know, works 40 hours. And then I have another guy who works 30, 30 hours. And, um, and then uh, Ben, who, who's our full-time um, help, his wife actually comes and helps my wife this year uh, do the actual pack shed. Because we're, we're, we're getting into a lot of grocery stores now, which is, it pays really well, but um, it is a lot more just, you know, packing and labeling and all that stuff. So she comes in on Tuesday and Thursday mornings and then help us, you know, wash and pack and get all that stuff out. So, you know, our goal is to be done harvesting and packing by, you know, lunchtime. Yeah. And then that's basically it. Now, so getting into grocery stores is is that something where you guys have, especially considering that you're talking about salad greens, have you guys needed to go through a gaps audit or anything like that for to be able to service that that marketplace? So yes and no. Um, the way we got in the grocery stores was we had a big account 
that was going to be just huge for us. And management changed like two days before our first order delivery went out. And it, it didn't work out like it was planned, which is, you know, um, it's, 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 it's part of, part of farming. So I started really hustling because I'm sitting on a lot of product, you know, last spring. And so I just happened to go in a small grocery store and saw that they had some local product and it was locally owned. So I talked to the owner and like, yeah, we'd love to have your stuff. So that's where they got started. He didn't need to, for it to be gap certified because you know, the owner worked in the store. It wasn't a chain, but you know, we've approached folks like whole foods. They do want you to be gap, uh, gap certified and certified organic. Yeah. But I, I, you know, on the grocery store, I, I feel like that is one market. Like if you're in a market and your farmer's market's flooded, there's no room, you know, you try to go hit up all the grocery stores, but there's already, you know, several farmers dominating that sector. <clears throat> Again, do the thing that no one else is willing to do. And that's pack all your greens and clamshells. Yes, it does take some more labor, but you know, you can still get um, paid really well and make a good living without having to go set up at the farmer's markets and, you know, go from chef to chef and figure out what they want this week and what they want next week. Re uh, grocery stores are such a pleasure to deal with. They're easy. They order on time. They're very consistent. They pay on time. So um, that's something we're definitely, we just picked up another grocery store last week pretty excited about and you know we've we are we are planning on getting gap in organic certified to really um really go with for, for after the big stores because we're definitely seeing a lot of new competition in other markets and i don't know if it's just the mid-south but the mid-south farmers market scene is dwindling rapidly um you know the memphis farmers market uh you know, there's been a few that's closed. I think their like their 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 attendees aren't half. Even our local my local farmers market in Jackson, you know, three years ago there was two thousand people there a day. You could barely walk and now it's it's gotta be less less than, than half half in attendance. And so we've realized the reality is though, not everybody shops at a farmers market. It's not convenient. They don't want to give up their Saturday mornings. And but every American, whether you're a big, you know, uh, farmer's market fan or not, you're going to go to a grocery store to shop. And those folks who do go to the grocery store and they see, oh, wow, here's a locally grown clamshell of salad mix. Here's, um, you know, some spinach or whatever greens or herbs. And I'm going to buy them because it looks just as good as the stuff from from California. <clears throat> It lasts way longer. And so I feel like there's a huge opportunity for beginning farmers who are really struggling to find their place in the ecosystem, so to speak. Because, you know, it's tough yeah. to get into a farmer's market that's had the vendors that's been there for 20 years. You know, it's, you know, if you're not selling a lot, it's not that your product is bad. It's just... There's a lot of a lot of vendors who've really developed a lot of loyal clientele that aren't just going to switch on a whim. Right. And I think that's I mean, the other thing with the with the retail stores, especially, and we sold a lot of product through retail stores on my farm. And I loved it because you could stop off and you can drop off a thousand dollars worth of product. Easy. In 20 minutes. Easy. You know, easy. And and so you've really cut down on your marketing costs. So yeah, you're taking a lower price, but the, right. the what it takes to actually make that sale is so much less and the yes. volume is so much more. Now it does introduce some risk factors because then, yep. you know, you got, if you're dealing with one or two big stores, having That's one right. of them stop buying your stuff can really can throw you for a, a loop. But, absolutely. But man, it was just, it was nice and it was fun. And you know what? I also say there's nothing, there is nothing cooler than walking into a grocery store and seeing your produce <laughs> on is, the shelf. It, you know how awesome that is. It is such a great feeling. It really is. It really is. Well, you know, I used to, I, I was used to stand in there and I'm like, I'm like, I wanted to say to the people that were next to me, I'm like, Hey, 
those are my herbs, right? You <laughs> right. See that? I grew that, right? I did that. That's right. That's right. Buy some, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. You know, and it's amazing, like, how many more people now who go to the farmer's market and, like, they don't buy salad mix, but they'll go, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm not going to get any today because I buy your stuff at the, at the grocery store. You know, it's right. it's just it's it's a been fascinating to watch over the, the last few years. And another thing is, I really do think, just at least here in the mid south, like there's a big push to like change our local like food economy and like get food in places where you know, you know, talk about all these food deserts. And I just feel like getting your product in a grocery store is such a great way to really make an impact on that local food. You know. Um, you know, economy. So I, I just think for some, I think it's a great thing for really beginning farmers to just, just take a look at. It's not for everybody. It does, you know, you got you got to move quick and fast. You know, you need to be, you need to be able to do, you know, three or four clamshells a minute, not, you know, one. So you, you definitely have to hustle. But I, I've, and another thing with uh, the grocery stores, Again, this is in my context because of how far I have to have to drive. You know, if I had 10 big grocery stores, I could essentially hire a driver to drop off a pallet out of each store. Where the farmer's market, you know, I, most farmers know how that is. You are the face of that farm. And you can't just hire anybody or else you could really, really hurt your, your sales or even your reputation as a vendor at that market. One of the things that I think is so important when you're going to grocery stores is quality. It's really getting in there with with good stuff, because if I'm selling something at a farmer's market, I'm handing somebody a head of lettuce. They're probably going to use it in the next couple of days. That's right. But if I'm taking a clamshell of lettuce to to a store, it might not even hit the shelf for three or four days. That's right. Depending on where they are in their stock rotation. Yes. So what have you guys made changes in in what you're doing from a from a quality perspective and yes to be able to serve yes. that market better yep so one thing that we we have found is um it starts with the harvest well you know yeah and so it starts with the harvesting so we typically like to harvest all of our greens before 8 a.m and there's something to harvesting greens when they're still cool and there's dew on it that just, you know, once the dew dries and that lettuce gets limp, you know, I'm not sure, like, you, you know, if you go out into your field at four o'clock in the afternoon, that head of lettuce or that, you know, Salanova salad mix, it's, it's not going to be happy. Like, it's really, really sad. And so if you, you know, the way I look at it as, um, you know, when you go to harvest, you can only maintain the condition that it's at. You can't really improve it. So if you're harvesting a sad looking lettuce, it's I mean, yeah, you can get it washed and it may look like it's a little perking up, but it's not going to it's just going to be in a sad state until, you know, it'll, it'll just go bad quick. Where if you're harvesting greens when they're happy, you know, and they're they're crisp and they're fresh and you keep it that way. So you're taking it from the field right to your walking cooler and it's staying cold and, you know, you're packaging it in a very cooled shed or packing house that's not hot. So it's never getting wilted. We've had folks tell us that our salad mix has lasted three weeks. And so nice. it's just taking those steps from the, the harvest, you know, and keeping it cool. Like we, we have a walk-in, a, a, a trailer that's insulated with spray foam. We have a cool bot in there so we can keep that lettuce cool literally from, you know, when the time it leaves the farm to the time it goes into the grocery stores. And I think that helps a lot. And, and you're right. And it's very important because, you know, just because it's local, it, it also has to, it needs to be better than, than what California has to offer or no one's just going to buy it just because you're local. So I, I think keep keeping it fresh, um, keeping your varieties and making sure it's not bitter, um, watching out for bugs and, you know, just all the basic, just quality. Paying attention to all those nuances really make an impact. One of our grocery stores last year said that our salad mix was the one of the top 10 selling items in their store. And they were really ecstatic about that because sometimes you just wonder, like, you know, how long are the grocery store going to keep working with a small farm, you know, who, you know, sometimes like, oops, you know, um, 
you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't have Rugel this week because it got too bitter or the germination didn't happen. You know, where we haven't quite nailed it perfectly all year round. So, you know, you wonder, but the fact that it's it's a top selling, it lasts for three weeks, all those things goes a long ways. And, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. So as long as the people are coming to buy, come back and buy more then um, you know, I, I think there's, there's, there's something there. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it's just so important whether you're selling at farmer's market or selling at the grocery store or, or whether you're picking what crops to grow is to, is to realize that you're not entitled to the business that you want. You know, you've got to find a place where you fit in and you got to provide a service that, that people need because nobody's obligated to buy local food. Right. Absolutely. No, no, they're not. You know, if this was not grocery stores were not part of our 2016 plan. It was a result of a big contract falling through and me being very, very hungry and very driven and going, OK, what is the one thing that farmers aren't doing? No one here is doing grocery stores. So, baby, here I come, you know. And so that's just kind of the way we've we've approached that. And I think with being a small farm, like there, you have that flexibility of just changing on a whim. And so now, you know, my wife and I were like, you know what? This is really nice. This is really stable. This is really consistent. We would love to just, just do grocery stores, you know, cause you could, it's a lot easier to hire somebody to pack a clamshell than it is fine to find someone who can really be nuanced enough with a Japanese paper pot transplanter. That's absolutely right. Anyway, so that's, that's kind of where, that's what's worked for us in, in our context. With that, Ray, we're going to take a quick break, get another word from us, another sponsor, and then we're going to come back and do our lightning round. This lightning round is brought to you by Farmers Web, software for your farm. Farmers Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time, increasing efficiency, reducing mistakes, and streamlining order management from start to finish. No more lost order slips and invoices. Know which of your buyers have already paid and which have not. Keep your records and download your financial data. Farmers Web helps you manage orders from buyers who place them online, but also those that order by phone or text or email. Save time and reduce errors by keeping all of your orders in one place, automatically generating harvest and picky lists, product catalogs, and packing slips. Farmers Web helps inform your buyers of delivery routes, pickup locations, lead times, order minimums, all while helping you keep track of buyer payment terms, special pricing, and customer information for every one of your buyers. A flat monthly fee and flexible plan types allow you to pause, cancel, or switch plan types from month to month at any time, even during the off-season. FarmersWeb.com so, Ray, what's your favorite tool on the farm? I'm really liking this Japanese paper pot transplanter. I think it's a pretty cool tool. And I don't think we've even started on the potential that it, it, can, it can have on a very small farm, especially when it comes to greens. And just the amount of time that it saves on labor of transplanting, it's, it's pretty cool. So I'll have to say that's definitely right now and it's definitely the most exciting tool that that we have so far awesome and what's your favorite crop to grow lettuce and i just love it there's something satisfying on yeah i mean just you know i i think the the challenges of the crop working with the varieties of all the seasons and the timing it's a challenge and and just watching a, a customer's face you know when you when you hand them a a head of lettuce in august it's it's very it's a very rewarding crop to grow nice and if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing what would it be it would be uh to not um to not have let any animals on your farm ever <laughs> um, just stay away no no uh, actually actually I, I think my the number one thing is is i wish I could have told myself to go work at a working, successful farm for one season, just one season. There is so much to be said. You know how many new nuances of things you just don't think about a packing shed layout, you know, how your greenhouse should be built in and aligned to your fields. And, you know, your, there's just so many things um, to see. And even, even just a, a, a normal farm, like maybe not a really crazy productive farm, but just even seeing the things that do not work 
you know, would have been really helpful just to say, you know what? I, I think there's a lot to say by beginning farmers going to another farm and just really observing. So I, I really, I really would have done that. It, it's, it's hard to do with a wife and two kids, but yes, it is. It is what it is. And I'm, I'm grateful for, for our journey regardless. All right. With that Ray, thank you so much for being part of the farmer to farmer podcast today. It was a blast, Chris. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 126 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Tyler. That's T-Y-L-E-R. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk behind farming equipment and high quality garden tools in North America and by Rock Dust Local the first company in North America specializing in local sourcing and delivery of the best rock dust and biochar for organic farming. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmer to farmer slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com. Ray Tyler is on the show because people kept asking for him. I'll do my best to get your suggestions on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.